If you'd like to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 22, we're going to begin with verses 31 and 32 and then move to Luke chapter 15 in just a little while. So thankful each of you are here. This scene in the life of Peter follows the scene that would correspond to John chapter 13 with a washing of feet and the Lord now taking the supper with them and telling them that he would not take it again with them until that day we took with them anew in the kingdom. It is the night before the Lord is crucified. Peter has said on numerous occasions that he would not forsake the Lord. And yet, at most every opportunity after that, something happened in which he did. On this occasion, before the betrayal and the crowing of the crow that will sound at his denying of Jesus. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. That is such a significant statement. The Lord gives Peter about how to move forward from failure in his life. It's overwhelming to me to try to grasp how Peter must have felt on this occasion. It's overwhelming to me to try to understand how Peter must have heard the words of the Lord. He said, I've prayed for you that your faith should not fall, but when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. The Lord is telling Peter his future. Not only occasion of stumbling, but the occasion that Peter will return and will indeed strengthen the people of God. Since we know the rest of the story, We know that's exactly what Peter did. On the crest of the nation of Austria are two animals. One is an emu, and this is not the blue emu as an advertising for liberty insurance. An emu and a kangaroo. The significance of those two animals on the crest is that neither one of them can go backwards. The emu has a three-pronged hoof and cannot go backwards. If it tried, it would fall. The kangaroo, because of the tail and the might of that tail, is not able to go backwards. In other words, what they're saying is, we're only looking forward. As children of God, there's only one direction that we can look. And that's forward. And so the question comes, when we have faced failure in our lives, whatever that may have been, whatever that experience is, how do we move forward? I read a quote this week in preparation for this. It said, most of us, most of us have failed. At least the best of us have. I like that. If you'd like to turn to Luke chapter 15. I want to take some lessons from this story, primarily from the prodigal, but the end we'll close with the older boy, the other son. The first thing I think that we have to do in order to move forward is, number one, we must come to ourselves. And look at what happens here. Beginning in verse 11, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided, them, divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together, He journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all there, arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave anything to him. 
Did you notice this young man's first response when he began to be in want? His first response when he began to be in want was not going to his father's house. His first response when he began to be in want was he go, went and joined himself to a citizen of the strange country. In other words, he's trying to find a solution to his problem himself. And that man had a solution for him. I'm going to let you go in the fields and work. The man hasn't thought a thing about the father yet. He's going to find a solution himself. And so his problem still exists. However, it says in verse 17, but, that's an important word. Because there's about to be a 180 change in direction here. But when he came to himself. Those are significant words. The first step in moving forward is not trying to find the solution to the problem ourselves. The first step in moving forward is coming to ourselves. Recognizing our ineptitude, recognizing our failure, recognizing how bankrupt and empty that we are. Responsibility begins within. And character is best understood when responsibility is acknowledged, accepted, and when we can acknowledge that we are the ones that are the problem when we come to ourselves. But as we learn with this young man, that may be the longest, hardest journey any of us ever travel. We're not told the distance this young man was from his father's house. But whatever it was and whatever the time frame was, the longest distance, the hardest distance this young man had to travel in his whole life at this point was to come to himself. If we don't recognize our need, if we have a need and we don't recognize our need, then we're not going to try to find the answer or solution to our problems. If we recognize our failure, but we don't acknowledge the failure and accept responsibility that this young man finally does, we're not going to have that need satisfied. We're not going to have that need supplied. And we'll always be struggling to try to find an answer for ourselves. I think an illustration of this is, is found in the life of David, 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 10 and following. He's now fleeing from the pursuit of Saul. But in so doing, he runs right to uh, the Philistines. And the king accepts him. But in order to remain in the land, he, he begins to foam at the mouth. He begins to feign being crazy. Until finally the people of, of, the country, of uh, Achish begin to tell the king to put David out of the country. In Psalm 34, he said... I cried and the Lord heard me. In Psalm 56, he said, I finally, in the midst of all my enemies, learned to trust in the Lord. This young man has traveled a long journey. Peter, in Galatians chapter 2, was just fine with the act of hypocrisy until Paul said, I'm going to come and withstand him to the face. Peter did not recognize the problem. And because Peter did not recognize the problem, he did not find the solution until Paul confronted him. We have to recognize the need. And if we don't acknowledge the need, then we're not going to come to ourselves. And we're not going to move forward. We're not going to move forward until we acknowledge that need. The second thing that I think that's important is we have to be open about who we are. Look at what this young man says further in verse 17. He said, how many of my Fathers, hired servants have bread and enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. In coming to ourselves, we, we have to come to understanding and be open about who we are. If we still have the veil of lacking or failing to acknowledge the responsibility, blinding our eyes, putting the, 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 blind, the, the shutters on so we can't see. And we're not honest about who we really are. This, this, this young man comes back not as a son. He comes back and says, can I just have a place in your house as a servant? He, he, he's acknowledging, I don't, I don't deserve a place at your table, Dad. But can I just come and serve in your house? Because your servants have it a whole lot better than, than cheek to jowl eating with the pigs out here. Can I, can I just come to you? 
You see, failure doesn't have to be an enemy. But all we have to do in order to, to help ourselves is we have to accept the responsibility and change who we are. We have to look at who we are and change who we are. I, I think of that occasion when the second missionary journey is about to begin. And Paul and Barnabas are having the dispute about whether or not John Mark is fit to go on the second journey. And Paul's not having it, as you know. Because something happened on the first journey that, that John Mark turned back. We don't know what it was, but something caused him to turn back. And it's such a great, a great contention. In fact, the text says it was a great contention that Paul and Barnabas split. Now, they, don't, they split. They come back together during the narrative of Acts. But here, Paul is saying of John Mark, this boy failed. I can't have this man on my team here. But John Mark changed himself. Because when Paul writes his last letter and he tells Timothy to bring whatever he needs, he says, and bring John Mark with you because he is good for me. John Mark changed his attitude and John Mark changed his actions. And his failure was not an enemy. But sometimes we fail to do that because of our own selfishness. Sometimes we fail to do that because we're concerned about what others will think about us. And sometimes we fail to do that because we measure ourselves by others. We look at ourselves and we see ourselves as an apt or a failure in somebody else's success. And because of that, we have the term of measurement and there's an inadequacy there. And because we feel that inadequacy, we don't feel like we, are, we can measure up. Paul will say in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, and also down to verse 17, if you measure about yourself by yourself, then you're always going to be wanting. But if you measure yourself by Christ, that's what we want to do. We're not measured by one another. We're measured by Christ. And then the Lord approves. That's what he's telling us there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. But we have to be open about who we are. The third thing I think that's important is we have to give our failures to God. If the father in this story is God. I want you to look at what this young man does. He says in verse 17, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? He sees who he is. I will rise and go to my father and say to him, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Do you see what this young man's doing? He arose then in verse 22 and came to his father. And when it was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, ran and, and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight, no longer worthy to be called your son. What's he doing? He's coming and he's, he's understanding who he is and he's laying what he's done before the feet of the father. Here's his father and he comes and he, he's just giving what he has to his father. I, I have sinned. When you think about how this, this story begins with this young man, he's just full of himself. It's quite obvious. Because in Oriental language, the response this young man gives to his father when he says, as we read it in kind of benign terms here, uh, give me my, my portion, what he's really saying in that, that kind of language is, I wish you were dead. The disrespect and then saying, I, I want my inheritance now, I wish you were good as dead. I don't know how the father obtained what he gave, whether he had to liquidate some stuff or whether he had it on hand, but here he comes and, and he gives to the son. But now the son comes and says, I asked you to give, but now I, I, come, I give to you. All I have to bring to you is not a son. I can't come to you as a son. I come to you as a servant. And I, I'm just giving everything I have to you. Can, can I just be a servant in your house, the only, only thing I can do is all I can do is come begging. I come asking. Please, please, can I just be a servant in your house? Here's everything, Dad. Here's everything I'm laying up before you. But you see, his failures were the key to moving him forward as well because he's got an opportunity. He's taking the opportunity here I'm reminded of, of David in this. 
we always kind of focus on one single thing, but there's several things in the life of David that we could focus on with David's failures. But in Psalm 145 and verse 14, David would write this, Psalm 145 and verse 14. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. How do you think David could have written that? Because that's what the Lord's done to him. He had fallen and he bowed down and the Lord raised him up. The Lord lifted him up. And so what he's saying is your failure doesn't have to keep you down. You can move forward from that. And that's what the Lord is telling us here. The next thing I think that's significant is we must seek help from wise people. The wisest person this man approaches here in this story is his father. But in Proverbs chapter 31 it says, if you want to be wise, walk with wise men. In other words, what we need is we need someone who has counsel for us. Counsel that will be loving yet firm, not critical. We need someone who, whom we can trust, someone who will, who will reach out and who will pull us in, not shun us. We need someone that will reach out a hand, not a scalpel. Someone that will lift up, not crush down. And we need someone in, whom, in whose counsel we, we can be wise with. And this young man needed someone wise. He went to his father to find that wisdom. Here's this young man. He's coming. We need someone wise that can see what we can't see. That can help us see. Here this young man reaches out to his father. And reaching out to his father, his father gives this. He says, I saw you when you were long. How, how come the father saw him while he was a long way off? Because he was looking. Because he was looking. The father's looking. And the son comes. The next thing I think that's significant in this story, while it's not stated, I think it's implied. It says, verse 17, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and despaired I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. If it's difficult to come to ourselves, is it challenging to admit who we are? If it's, if it's significant to, to uh, seek wise counsel, here may be the hardest thing in this story. And this may be the hardest thing any of us face. Is being able to forgive ourselves. David struggled with that. We see in the life of David. Forgiveness simply means to set the prisoner free. And the prisoner that's being set free is me. I'm releasing the charge, and the charge is going away. I'm releasing the prisoner, and the prisoner's set free. Now, yes, that forgiveness can take place. It doesn't happen in a moment. It may happen over a process of a lifetime. But that forgiveness is setting the prisoner free. And here this young man comes acknowledging. He's setting himself free to come to the Father here. There's a freedom that comes with this young man asking for forgiveness. He's setting himself free. How many times when we fail do we turn that inward? How many times when we turn that inward then does that inward turn of that and that inability to forgive ourselves and move past the failure begin to define and begin to crush us? Someone says, the greater the faith, the deeper the disappointment. Another said, failure is the hinge upon which the door of grace opens wide. I love that. This young man comes to his father. He comes asking for forgiveness. The door of opportunity, the door of grace to be opened wide to him. And we see the father receives. That, that disposition, that willingness 
to look hard at who we are and forgive ourselves. Maybe the hardest of all. The next thing that we see is we must have a daily walk with God. This point's not in the story. If you turn back to Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, this does relate to Peter. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, after the statement that Peter makes, Lord, I'll always be with you, verse 22, Peter takes him aside and said, begin to rebuke him and said, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen. But he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me, you are not mindful of things of God, but things of man. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. If we're going to move forward from failure, we have to daily walk with God. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the very last passage in that, in that section. There's an interesting statement in verse 27 that Paul gives that I think has, has some application here for us. He's just finished talking about this uh, competition kind of uh, analogy here, running and so running, fighting and so fighting. But then he comes down in verse 27 and said, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. We read that, that, that passage there, and he said, I, I, I discipline my body. The old King James said, I buffet my body. The new King James said, I discipline my body. That, that, there's an imagery behind that that's powerful for us. It used to be in times of boxing. Before we began to be more sanitary with the gloves, though it's still pretty cruel, uh, that were there. What you have is you would have the opponents that would wrap their hand with, with something that would be like a rawhide type material. And they'd wrap their hands wet. And they'd take that material that would be supple that you could have things embedded in. And they would take it and they would, they, they would grind into it sharp objects. You might think of pieces of glass or shard or, or steel or something like that. Something that would cut. And then it would dry and it would set. And then they would go into the ring with those things covering their hands. And the key to debilitating the opponent was to hit the opponent in the eye. To strike the opponent in the eye. Because if you could disable his sight, you can defeat him. In fact, even today in boxing matches, even with the gloves that they have, when an opponent's eye becomes such that it's swollen, many times it's called a technical knockout. They'll stop the match. Why? Because the eye's been debilitated. What Paul is saying here is, is I daily debilitate my eye. I daily, I daily discipline myself. He's taking this and now I daily discipline my eye because when I preach the gospel, I don't want to be disqualified. A part of our daily walk with God is our daily discipline. And that daily discipline can be seen in having to learn all over again to read the Word of God. It can be seen to learn how to pray to God. We need to ask ourselves, what are we eating? Are we eating religious, spiritual junk food? Religious cotton candy? Are we, are we eating the meat of God's Word? What are we eating? What are we taking in? We have to learn to walk again. We have to learn to pray again. We have to learn our daily walk with God again. When I think of these last two, I think of Paul. I think of Paul when I think of someone struggling to forgive himself. I, I think of Paul when, when he will say this in Philippians chapter, chapter 3. Uh, forgetting the things that are behind. Reaching forward, I press toward the mark. Stretching forward, I press toward the mark. Forgetting the things that are behind. Well, if you're forgetting them, then why don't you bring them up? Forgetting the things that are behind. And yet, nine or ten times in the, New in the, in the writings of Paul, you'll find a statement similar to this. Uh, I was the greatest or chief persecutor. Or I'm like a baby born out of due season. I don't fit. I, I don't fit the rest of the apostles. What Paul, Paul never forgot that he was a persecutor. Then how can he say, forgetting the things that are behind? How, 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 how 
can he say that? You think when he went back to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 9 and he had the chance to preach, he's not thinking, I'm sure sorry, I'm, I'm sure sorry. When he says, forgetting the things that are behind, what he's saying is, he's come to a place and having been able to forgive himself and having been able to walk with God where those things no longer grind on him and pull him down. They no longer have the power and the influence that they once had over me. And so he says, I'm going to let the past be the past. And I'm going to learn the lessons from the mistakes, the sins, the mess-ups and failures. And the fact that I have had failures does not mean I'm a failure. It means I can be forgiven and be forgiven, forgive myself, and begin again my daily walk with God. And be in His embrace. Have His Spirit be my spirit. And daily walk with Him. In 1 John chapter 1, I think this is something of what the Lord has in mind when he begins in verse 7. 1 John chapter 1. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you get that? If we... If we come to ourselves, if we open who we are, and we come give our failure to God, if we seek His wise counsel and forgive ourselves and walk with Him, what does He do? He forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. <coughs> if we say we have no sin, we make Him a liar, His word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you that you sin not. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have one who will stand and plead our case for us who will be our comforter when we need to be comforted. In other words, what God provided for us is He provided a path forward. Because when He says, you become my child, when you become my child, when you become my child, you don't move back. There's only one direction is moving forward. You ever pay attention to our body language? When we talk about heaven, which direction is that? That's moving forward, isn't it? And we talk about hell, what do we do? It's like that. Which direction is that? That's moving backwards. We never talk about heaven, hell, do we? We're moving forward. We're not going backwards. And so, there's a path forward for us, and God provides that path forward for us. Now, back to Luke chapter 15 real quickly as I close. Because there's something in Luke 15 for me and for you here. And there's a contrast that is, so, that is stark here because the parable really is about the contrast. The parable really is not about the first boy, though I've taken the lesson for the first boy. He's the He's the path to get to the second boy, which is really what the lesson is, because the lesson's in verses 1 and 2. All the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them, so he's going to let them know what a sinner looks like who comes to the Father. And the first lesson we have to learn from this is how did the Father receive him? Like a father receives. He welcomed him home. But how did the Pharisees receive him? How did the older brother receive him? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you what I have done and what he's done. And let me tell you what he needs to do in view of what I have done. Question. Which one do we want to be? Do we want to be the father? Or do we want to be the older brother? You see, there's a way home because we come and we bow in wonder and lay it down. 
and lay it down. And lay it down. There's only one direction for the child of God. And that's forward toward the sun. And that's the path we're going. If we can help you move that way, we've got a hand extended. I'll be standing while we sing.